Hi everyone, thank you for coming. This is Lola, I am the Harvard and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center site coordinator for the New England MHTTC. I'll start by going over a few housekeeping items before we begin. <clears throat> Participant microphones will be muted at entry. You have time to unmute them during the chat portion. If you have questions during the event, please use the chat. If you have questions after this session, please email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. This session is being recorded and it will be emailed to all participants once available. At the end of the month, we will send you a certificate of completion that you can submit to your particular board for continuing education credit. Please contact ifisher at c4innovates.com for more information on CEs after this event. These are some MHTTC acknowledgements. The MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. That language is strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing-centered and trauma-responsive, inviting to individuals participating in their own journeys, person first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear and understandable, and lastly, consistent with our actions, policies and products. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Keshavan for some introductions. Uh, thank you, Lola, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's my incredible honor and pleasure to introduce my friend uh, and legendary actor and psychiatrist, Dr. Mohan Agashe, uh, who will speak to us today as part of this uh, webinar series on uh, mental health education via the prism of or the lens of mental health. And this is a series that is sponsored by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, SAMHSA, through what we call MHTTC, that is the Mental Health Technical Transfer Network. And this particular series is focused on wellness following the COVID pandemic geared towards healthcare professionals. Now, when I think about the topic of today, you know, I, I think about what are we, what have we learned uh, through this huge natural experiment, the pandemic that happened over the last three plus years. One thing personally I can say, which I'm sure many of you will resonate with is, I certainly saw a lot of movies. I would say, uh, as Mohan frequently points out, movies are not just for entertainment, but it is for education and to kind of improve ourselves as well. And Dr. Mohan, Mohan Agashe exemplifies these aspects of film. He, uh, I have known Mohan as long as I have been a psychiatrist and I got to know him from my training days as a psychiatrist over 40 years ago. Um, he uh, headed the Department of Psychiatry uh, in Pune and also led the, the um, State Institute of Mental Health and has been an advisor to various national level mentally mental health policy issues. So in his own right, he's a phenomenal psychiatrist. But he is the he unique person who has also um, treaded an, another path equally successfully um, as an actor, director, and teacher of the trade of filmmaking. Um, he has acted in Hollywood and Bollywood movies, you know, famous movies you will recognize, Gandhi, Mississippi Masala, and many Bollywood movies, uh, some of you will be familiar with, and more recently, uh, more educationally oriented, not as well known, but very powerful movies on different aspects of mental health, such as Astu, which took on Alzheimer's disease, CASA, which took uh, on depression, um, and, uh, and uh, Devrai, which took on schizophrenia and psychosis and so forth. So Mohan, uh, his legacy has been to combine the powerful aspect of uh, 
film um, with the needs of mental health education throughout his life and more particularly in the recent few years. And of course, he has been suitably honored um, nationally and internationally by many awards. And uh, I would say just uh, as an aside, just last month, he was awarded a national level award um, called uh, Punya Bhushan, which uh, was accompanied by a small biographical video clip. If time permits, we will show them a little bit later as well. So he um, has received the Indian equivalent of the Presidential Medal called Padma Shri and several other awards, too many to mention. And at the same time, he's a very down to earth, humble man um, who really puts the bigger cause above himself. And, you know, just to illustrate the fact that he came out between shootings of, uh, of film in Calcutta to get onto his phone to do this lecture speaks volumes on Mohan Agashi. So um, he's not going to show a lot of slides. He will make his um, points uh, through a series of movie clips. Hopefully the technology will work. And, um, and then he has a few slides as well. Since this is a one and a half hour presentation, we would have a fair amount of time to um, you know, interact with Dr. Agashe and ask any questions. And if time permits, we will then give you a glimpse of his uh, life story itself. So with that, uh, take it away, Mohan. And um, so I won't stand anymore between you and the audience. Thank you. Uh, Mohan, you're muted. You're, you're muted, Mohan. Unmuted. Um, you're still muted. We still can't hear you. Uh, Mohan, we're having some trouble hearing you. I don't know if he is aware. Mohan, we can't hear you right now. If you want to check your microphone. Are you able to hear me now? Uh, now we can hear yes. you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So, Mohan, okay. uh, maybe you could speak uh, and then we'll get your the first film clip whenever you tell us. Okay. <clears throat> now, the topic I chose today, learning through the lens, you can say it was a sort of accidental finding for me. Hmm. When I entered medical college, I realized that it was very difficult for me to learn through those very big textbooks. <clears throat> right in the first year, when I saw Gray's Anatomy, I said, my God, I thought probably this was meant more for physical exercise than mental exercise. And then I realized that the problem was not with the book. The problem was with me. I found it very difficult <coughs> to understand by reading. But if the same thing was told to me, I found it easier to understand. I also realized another advantage that if I had to read and from written word convert everything into my senses, like how that word will look, how that place will look, 
what were the sounds of those place <coughs> which is all given in description then it takes longer time actually also compared to what you can see in a film in one minute it takes about half an hour to read to create that kind of multilingual communication and so i found out i i need to do something about it and that was the period which was 1970 or something when learning disability was neither much known at least in my part of the country and definitely the schools and colleges didn't know about it maybe few medical colleges and few doctors knew about it so it was of no use trying to tell my parents that i find it difficult to understand by reading then i had to find my own solution and what i started doing i started going to the library it was not with the intention to read big books but it was with the intention to find those people who understand and enjoy reading those books so i used to find a very convenient place from where i could observe people and <clears throat> i was right i saw some very intelligent friends of mine coming with the thick books and reading full concentration now my job was to observe them and to see who exactly understands by reading ah and then by their nonverbal communication i knew because when they were reading their full attention in the book didn't look anywhere else they had their highlighter or a pencil or a pen to underline the sentences underline the important words <clears throat> but however intelligent after about 1 hour or so the brain would get tired anybody's brain gets tired and after that they will show some signs of little distraction say by yawning or putting their hands and that was my opportunity i would quickly walk up to this friend of mine and say shall we have a cup of coffee and he would be very happy that he didn't go for coffee somebody else has asked him for a coffee and the only thing he said sure but we must be back very quickly because i have to study and i said of course and then we went for a cup of coffee and my only job was to sort of do controlled provocation so he tells me all what he has read in next 10 minutes that way i found it was much easier that somebody reads for an hour and i know what he read in about 10 minutes time and i chose the right kind of people and that is why senior batches i had very good friends i had their books and their notes and everything and that was the first time though not consciously i realized that reading textbook is not the only way to educate ourselves and then when i started thinking later as i became a teacher i realized why it was so and what is important in psychiatry particularly that we also have to think about emotions not all medical professionals professions think about emotions particularly those who are hardcore biological psychiatrists and biological doctors but i realize soon that nobody walks walks into a clinic only with the body so if at all there is concept of health there has to be mental health in all kind of health and any kind of branch be it orthopedics be it medicine be it gynec and obstetrics ent whatever it is because with any kind of illness it knowingly or unknowingly affects your attitudes 
and emotions. <coughs> One of the major problems was, and still today is, it's kind of a chicken and egg story. Whether emotions come first or intelligence come first. It is still not, not resolved today. But I realized that when the language of oral language was added to a written language. Because, now let's start right at the beginning. Before we develop thinking brain, <coughs> primarily we were as emotional beings as many of other animals. And we could communicate emotions without words. But as the brain developed, we felt the need to communicate our thoughts to each other. And that's how the language of word was born. But first it was spoken language, much before it became a written language. And when we were in the oral phase, still we used to communicate with each other by performance, not only by words, like I'm doing it now. Though virtually, but you can see me. I take pause. <clears throat> I do this. If sometimes I'm not able to find word, I try to compensate by my gestures, by my body language. It happens much better when I meet you in person than when I meet you virtually on this. But then I realized that as long as we were in oral tradition, we had multilingual communication. So language of image, which was already present, we could see each other. Language of sound, and those were not words. Those were sounds, and emotions were expressed by sounds only. <clears throat> All those kind of things. And so when the word came, we had a multilingual communication communication, simultaneous multilingual communication. The word went to the conscious mind for analysis. And image and sound went to subconscious and unconscious. So it was simultaneous conscious, subconscious and unconscious communication. But as our thinking brain developed more and more and more and a voice and very intelligent person developed the first technology of converting an oral word into written word. That was our first technological development to find something which today can be called writing material. And then finding a spoken word to be transcribed on the paper as a written word. But in this process, what happened? You know something? That when we migrated from oral to written word, the word lost, word became an orphan and lost its parents. Like his image and his sound. But this intelligent man was very intelligent. So he counseled the word, said, don't worry. I have a nice place for you to stay. And he opened a wonderful orphanage for this written word called book. And he kept all those written words in the book and not only kept them, but disciplined them. And that is called the grammar. He said, if you have to live here, you must observe certain rules so that you are able to communicate with each other. So this is called the grammar of the written word. Now, the oral word also had grammar, but it was a grammar, non-verbal grammar. And I think that was very important. Now what happened suddenly, you see, the orators were replaced by writers. And written word practically took over all the professions, including education, entertainment, and information. So, written word was our source for all these three things, education, 
entertainment and information. Because we gradually lost the ability to communicate through image and sound, because when we read the book, that's the first, I would say, a schizoid trait of the linguistic communication is those who practically enjoy only reading and not talking with each other. That's my contention. But many of them are very interesting. Now, what happened? What happened when the written word became the primary mode of education and dominated educational field? First, it left out large percentage of people who were not adequately cognitively developed. But then those who were admitted for formal education were only of average intelligence. And suddenly there were discovery of IQ, intelligence quotient. Now, all of us, all of us in formal education have to learn reading and writing, not only one language, but probably more than two languages. In India, for me, definitely three languages. My mother tongue, that is my regional language, Hindi as my national language, and English as a kind of internationally communicative language. So if you realize that language primarily came for communication, not as an art medium. Same thing happened also about art forms, like word became necessary to communicate thought that did not absolve communication of emotions. And emotions were gradually, gradually communicated to words. And today, actually, the real situation, take a pause and think, we think emotions. I don't think we feel emotions. The reason is <clears throat> earlier, the source of information was limited. And because there was no information revolution. So source of information were parents, then near relatives. Then by the time you develop for first five to six years, generally we didn't go to school anywhere in the world because those formative years, basically we are developing our sensory systems like seeing, listening, smelling, touching, and taste. Now these are like five antennas. And through these antennas, we collect information about the world. Now this process of developing our sensory systems continues till we are five, six years old. And then we start developing the cognitive brain or the thinking brain. But thinking brain primarily is kind of a CPU. This, the job of thinking brain or this neocortex is to interpret simultaneously received information from all these five senses and to give it a meaning which is very subjective. And that is why the definition of perception was meaningful interpretation of sensation. So naturally, as you see the development line and written word captured the entire profession of education, as you know, because many of them were left out of formal education. Now, many of these people who were left out were highly sensitive people. And those who were very sensitive became artists, did not lose anything by not going to school or formal education. And those 
who went through formal education did not necessarily become the writers, but all of them become readers. Now, here is the crux. We all who have gone through formal education are readers, but not necessarily writers. And that is because we are actively taught reading. Without being taught, nobody will be able to read a book. They'll be able to see a book. If the book drops, they'll be able to hear a sound because all these sensory systems can be used passively as well as actively. And since formal education, we are taught actively only to read. We are not taught to see actively or listen actively. And that is why it took so many years after the discovery of IQ to develop EQ and the emotional quotient. <coughs> because all wisdom does not come through books. Rather, let's look at it like that. When gradually from books, we develop other modes of communication, particularly electronic, the information become much more before experience. To make it short, I'll say that earlier times, we had a lot of experience before we had mature intelligence to analyze. And so information came very late. Experience came first, exactly opposite to what is happening today. Today, we have a lot of information before we have any experience. And particularly because human beings are such animals who take such a long time to develop. Till first five to six years, we are developing our sensory systems. And then we even still continue our physical development. And after physical development ends at maybe 15, 16 adolescent, we still continue to develop mentally. And now some of you who have experience can say that eventually we develop our spiritual experiences or the capacity also. Now, for a person like me, I realized that when this word became orphan and was wondering what happened to his parents now, many years later after writing came, came the radio. And this wise intelligent man shown this orphan word. That's where your sound is, voices. And just about 150 years ago or so came the movie screen and you were able to see the image of a sound. Now, funny thing was that when we learned reading and writing for so many years, and didn't learn seeing and listening because they are not tangible as the book is. They're intangible. And so the word kept on wondering what to do because no word found the sound, found the image. The image was on the screen, sound was in the sky satellite, and the word was in the book. Now, in the, at the advent of 21st century, because of our new technology, the one I'm using called mobile, sound, image, and word, all together, the family has found an affordable and accessible home. The only problem is all these years, we have actively learned only to read, but not to listen and to see. That we still continue passively. And there are several examples of that. 
and to me for sure the dangers of passive seeing and listening are worse than passive smoking smoking damages only body and the reason for me to say this is because in the process of developing this formal education and bias towards cognitive development altogether we have ignored training of sensitive mind and sensitivity over a period is being reduced or has been translated only in words and not necessarily into experience and that is why i dare to make a statement today most of us think emotions we don't feel emotions if at all we want to see emotions experience emotions we experience emotion through the other person in a film in theater in literature and that is why i think all these are richer sources of education provided we actively learn to see actively learn to listen and actively learn to think i will rest here to make my point clearly i'll request to show you a one minute film and that film is from the festival call uh, from ability this is the film let's see the film first 60 seconds to pay கடையில <laughs> வாங்கிட்டு <laughs> well this film is less than a minute and is from the competitive film festival called 60 seconds to fame this film is like a cartoon with a caption many times we read newspapers and many of us formerly read newspaper particularly times of india in india to see what is the new cartoon of rk lakshman every day because he made a very relevant comment just through a sketch and a caption in this film as you see if you have seen the film and read the last caption ignorance about ability is disability and it's actually about two persons with same kind of disability but one who has learned the ability to do something in spite of his disability and on living and the other one is begging i think the point this film makes in one minute probably a uh, one hour lecture won't be able to do it because the lecture will be only words and not because when you see this film you see these characters the way they speak with each other intonations and everything all right though this film had some language because it was made in <clears throat> south india i do also don't understand that language 
but I understood the film. Now we see a film, which many of you might have seen, is about learning the importance of belt, sitting belt, which you use while driving. Well, I think one of the reasons I like to show this film is you don't need to even explain or talk. And this is called experience. Now, I want to make a point. When you read only the written word, when you get only information, Many a times, there is a tendency to mistake information for knowledge. But having a lot of information may not be or is not knowledge. And not only that it is not knowledge, it can create confusion rather than clarity in mind. And that is why it is important that though we have textbook, we also have school and everybody of us learns to read and write. We still have schools and colleges and we don't have only libraries because if everybody would become wise just by reading, what was the need for teacher, school and college? But we have school system for the written word, for the books. We don't have that system for the other languages of language and sound. For health community. Yes, uh, you want to say something, Keshavan? Do you want to take any questions now? Otherwise, I would go in for the last film. Well, and whenever Which, you, whenever you are ready for the next film, we could do that. Yeah. And next film is definitely about health education and what to learn, what I learned from it. I will talk afterwards. But maybe when you see it and tell me what anybody can learn from it then I will give you my comments okay. so as to make a point why I think that proper use of films is a richer mode of communication both for emotions and thoughts than book which is a half lingual communication basically only for thought because Every person who reads does not necessarily have the ability to convert a written word 
into good image, good sound. Those who have that ability have become filmmakers. And today's world, as I told you, where image and sound has become accessible and affordable. But only thing we have learned is reading. It becomes necessary to differentiate between light differentiate between a good book and a bad book. Bad book rather, a book from which you can learn and the book which is only for uh, a kind of purgation, emotional purgation and not for thought provocation. But that point I will come later. Let us see a film made by one of our brilliant students of films <clears throat> when I was the director of Film Institute. And the name of this film is Three of Us. So let's see that first. Yeah, and also the, um, I want to um, request all, the, all those in the audience to feel free at the end of the film to um, unmute yourself and ask any question or put any questions in the chat. Thank you. Oh, 
हम सकते हैं मतलब प्रोग्राम नहीं किए हम
Hello. Oh, hi, Mohan. Hi. Great, very powerful uh, the clip. 
I have one one comment on the chat by Jyoti Joshi. Yeah. She says, uh, so true about art. In JJ School of Art, they didn't teach us anything. I realized it after graduating. Thank you. Yeah. And I have one question for you, since yeah. I don't see anything from the audience. Um, so I just want to, you know, clarify my understanding of uh, your main message. Yeah. Your main message is that we as humans have forgotten the power of uh, the image and sound and yeah. be using it in addition to language, not instead of language, right? So the point is, you know, it, the communication is the best when we use all uh, modalities of communications in a synergistic manner. Yeah. Not any one more than the others. Is that Very true. I have other point also to make that whether oral, written, or these other sensory modalities came, they primarily came as modes of communication and not as art forms. And those individuals who could perform, had the ability to perform in one mode became artists. And so this is like positive, negative. Hmm. You cook well, though you may not be able to write a good book on cooking. You also need people who can eat tastefully. Those who sing also need people who know the essence and the trivialities of good singing. So you need good readers then become writer. So mode of communication, but any modality first came as means of communication. And from that it developed into an art form. So the it is not good idea to separate art from rest of life. Yeah. How you use particular form defines whether you are an artist or a connoisseur of that art. And both are equally good and equally important. And like you said, therefore, that to be conversant with all modalities of <clears throat> communication <clears throat> is powers. Because then the communication becomes richer and better. Yep. Thank you. Um, so, Elisabetta Del Rey has her hand up. Elisabetta, you want to speak up? Uh, yes, hi. Wonderful talk and very, very um, touching movie. I just have two, one comment and one question. The comment is about the movie. Beside humanity, I, I see the mother as the essential element in everything, even in this movie. She's the one that is keep it keeping things going so um and i feel it's true also in the movie and then another question um i am a student of siddhartha uh, and i ask you whether at the end of the day it's true that the, there are no teachers and you know the world is around us and it's the word that is our teacher. And that's it. And thank you so much. Well, I would like to add something to what you have said is good and correct. And it's not only humanity. It's thinking about the other and not thinking only about self. Mm -hmm. A family which has no other means like of other technological help can still live happily and change the attitude and the mode of living, which we call humanity, to create 
better living for all three of them. I know that, and if you have carefully seen, the mother who is really doing everything for the child is as happy as the son is. And father is like a burnout person. You, throughout the film, you have not seen him smiling or doing anything at all. Now, this is what I meant by seeing captives. So it's not only humanity, but humanity is also very important in medicine because technology cannot substitute humanity. I mean, with technical aids, you can get the pleasure of living, but you will not get the nostalgia of living. There is a great difference between memory and nostalgia. And if life has to be richer, then your memories have to be not only stored intellectually, but experientially. And the ability to convert information into knowledge and knowledge into wisdom, information and intelligence and emotion. If they work together, then gradually we can grow from information to knowledge and wisdom. And at the end, whatever the length of life is, the quality of life is far more important than the length of life. And today, many professions have primarily focused on only two functions which gives us a state of being and non-being. And that is only respiration and circulation. But for me to live as a good human being, all other functions are equally good and equally important, particularly emotion. And emotion as a function has been ignored for a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I have one other question while we are waiting for yeah. questions from the audience. Um, you know, knowing that you are both an actor and a doctor, um, and given that the uh, you know, majority of the audience here are healthcare professionals of some kind or the other, especially mental health care prof professionals, um, we'd like to hear your thoughts on how you use the power of um, emotion, expression, uh, as well as communication of emotion as a tool in being a better mental health professional, being a better diagnostician and a better communicator of complex issues in our day-to-day -day communications with patients. I'm sure you can think of examples in your own practice as to how you have used drama as a way of more effectively doing the job of a mental health professional. It would be great to hear from you on those things. Thank you very much. Now, if you honestly see that actor like me and my other professions are very few people who, while acting, publicly say that they are acting, but the way act has to be very so convincing as if you think it's a slice of life. <laughs> While all others are acting, but without, say, it is not for the others. They are acting as a coping mechanism. Because in a family, you play different roles. What is playing role of a mother? What is playing role of a father? What is play, role playing of a friend? It's not only drama. It's also emotional give and take. Is the difference between sympathy and empathy. Intelligence, you can learn sympathy. But putting yourself in somebody's shoe helps you to develop empathy. And empathy and emotional experience. After all, like illness is like food. If you eat, my hunger can't get quenched. If I drink water, your quest, your quest for water doesn't get in. Similarly, person who is ill 
has to bear the consequences of illness, but knowing that somebody is with him and who cares for him reduces the pain of suffering and improves the quality of life. So I think life cannot be measured only by length, but life has to be measured by the quality and the definition of therapy is not only to keep the person live and functioning, but enjoy his functioning to improve. And therapy does not mean cure. Therapy means improving the quality of life. So whenever we think of art as means of therapy, we are not necessarily talking of cure, but quality. But many times there are examples that changing your attitude can help you to live even better and even longer life. In fact, one of our earlier medical books, Anatomy of an Illness, much before any technological development has clearly elucidated this role of emotion in the quality of life. Thank you, Mohan. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? There is one, Walid uh, Yasin has his hand up. Walid? Uh, hi, Dr. Agesh. Um, thank you so much for this really inspiring talk. And I love your approach that when somebody enters the clinic, it's not just a body that is entering the clinic, but a whole person and your perspective on taking emotions into account. Um, in terms of film and mental health, so far, Hollywood has not been very successful in representing individuals with uh, different mental health conditions. And while they have the best intentions of my, in mind in order to kind of uh, represent uh, these individuals, they end up sort of creating a stigma uh, because they kind of like highlight certain behaviors, especially negative behaviors about individuals with different mental health conditions. And so um, I'm just wondering from your perspective, what is your, like, what would be an advice or how would you uh, go about um, making a movie about individuals with different mental health conditions, but um, not, you know, how would you navigate the stigma that might come out, uh, you know, come along with that? Um, you know, films help to clear the misunderstandings and myths about anything. Because films give experience of life and they don't only give thoughts about life. That's the difference between the medium of cinema, theater, or literature than only talking about it. If the word doesn't get translated into action, then only talking intelligent doesn't help. In fact, I would say like this, that think about the life. Life of emotion is shortest. Thought lives longer than life. Thought lives longer than emotion. But action lives longer than thought. The drive, motivation, is in the domain of emotion. Thought is how to use that emotion to convert into action. And action comes from a strong drive. So in spite of emotion getting converted into thought, you still have emotion left to convert it into action, which is the most important thing. So if cognitive development stops only at talking intelligently, then it's incomplete development as a human being. That's the way I look at it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Any other questions from the audience? If not, we could have a movie clip, a, a biographical clip about Dr. Agashe, um, and then we can finally come back to maybe some, some other thoughts, that uh, additional thoughts that Mohan might have for us. Um, so Lola, do you want to share that?
Long years ago, we made a trip with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our. पंद्रह अगस्त एकोणीसशे सत्तेचाळीसच्या मध्यरात्री जेव्हा नेहरू नियतीशी करार करू पाहत होते तेव्हा दूरवर भोर इथं एक बावीस दिवसांचं बाळ झोपेत खुदकन हसत होत त्या बाळाचं नाव होतं मोहन मोहन एक वर्षाचा असताना आगाशांचं कुटुंब पुण्याला स्थायिक झालं आई वडील एक थोरली बहीण आणि पाठचा भाऊ आर्थिक परिस्थिती बेताचीच गोबऱ्यांसाठी शेण गोळा करायचं आणि त्यासाठी रस्त्यावरून जाणाऱ्या गाई मशीनवर लक्ष ठेवायचं हे लहानग्या मोहनचं काम त्याच्या संवेदनशीलतेमुळे शाळेत ताम्हणकर गुरुजी त्याला रड्या आगाशे ह्या नावानं हाक मारायचे शाळेत मोहननं गरजेपेक्षा जास्त अभ्यास कधीच केला नाही पहिले वगैरे आलो तर अपेक्षा वाढणार आणि त्या पुरवण्यासाठी मग नाटक खेळ सोडावं लागणार हा शहाणपणा त्याला लहान वयातच सुचला त्या काळी बालोद्यांचे दर रविवारी कार्यक्रम व्हायचे त्यात नेमीनाथ उपाध्याय यांच्या नकला पाहून मोहनलाही मग हा छंद जडला ह्या निमित्ताने त्याने सई परांजपेंच्या बालनाटकातूनही कामं केली पुढे पुरुषोत्तम वझ्यांनी डाकघर नाटकात काम करायला मोहनला पाठव अशी थेट आज्ञाच वडिलांना दिल्यामुळे महाराष्ट्रीय कलोपासक संस्थेतर्फे मोहन मग नाटक करू लागला मॅट्रिकच्या परीक्षेत मात्र त्याचा नम्रात न येण्याचा निश्चय मोडला आणि नॅशनल स्कॉलरशिप मिळाल्यामुळे त्याचा कॉलेज शिक्षणाचा मार्ग प्रशस्त झाला बी जे मेडिकल कॉलेजमध्ये प्रवेश घेतल्यावर पुरुषोत्तम करंडकाच्या नाटकांमध्ये त्यांनी अभिनय केला आणि सरहद्द या नाटकासाठी अभिनयाचं पहिलं पारितोषिकही पटकावलं बीजेच्या काळात मोहनला डॉक्टर विद्याधर वाटवे यांसारखे आयुष्यभराचे सांगाती लाभले तिथेच त्याची भेट एका हरहुन्नरी गुरुमित्राशी झाली त्याचं नाव डॉक्टर जब्बार पटेल नाटकांकडे गंभीरपणे पाहायला मोहनला जब्बारने शिकवलं एकोणीसशे साली जब्बार पटेल विजय तेंडुलकर आणि पुण्यातल्या काही नाटकवेड्या तरुणांनी महाराष्ट्राच्या सांस्कृतिक भूमीवर भूकंप घडवून आणला ह्या भूकंपाचं नाव होतं घाशीराम कोतवाल या नाटकात नाना फडणवीसांची अजरामर भूमिका साकारली होती डॉक्टर मोहन आगाशे यांनी ज्याच्याशिवाय मराठीच काय तर भारतीय नाटकाचा इतिहास लिहिलाच जाऊ शकत नाही अशा या प्रयोगाच्या निमित्तानं प्रचंड सामाजिक गदारोळ झाला आणि तरीही हे नाटक बंद पडू द्यायचं नाही या जिद्दीनं जब्बार सतीश आळेकर डॉक्टर आगाशे आणि पी डी एच्या इतर तरुण नाट्यकर्मींनी मिळून एकोणीसशे त्र्याहत्तर साली थिएटर अकादमीची स्थापना केली घाशीराम कोतवालचे युरोप अमेरिका व रशिया येथील बारा आंतरराष्ट्रीय नाट्य महोत्सवांमध्ये प्रयोग झाले या दौऱ्यांचं संपूर्ण संयोजन डॉक्टर मोहन आगाशे यांनी एकहाती सांभाळलं घाशीराममुळेच डॉक्टर आगाशे देशा परदेशात अभिनेता म्हणून ओळखले जाऊ लागले नंतर त्यांनी अशी पाखरे येथी खेळिया बेगम बर्वे आधे अधुरे काटकोण त्रिकोण अशा पंचवीसहून अधिक नाटकांमध्ये विविधांगी भूमिका साकारल्या सत्यजित रे श्याम बेनेगल गोविंद निहलानी डेव्हिड अॅटनबोरो मीरा नायर यासारख्या दिग्दर्शकांच्या मंथन निशांत जैत्रे जैत गांधी मिसिसिपी मसाला अशा कलात्मक चित्रपटांपासून ते यश चोप्रा प्रकाश झा राकेश मेहरा यांच्या मशाल मृत्युदंड रंग दे बसंती सी वुल्व्ज इत्यादी लोकप्रिय अशा शंभरहून अधिक चित्रपटातून त्यांनी काम केलं अभिनयाचा हा झपाटा सुरू असतानाच डॉक्टर आगाशे मनोविकृतीशास्त्र अर्थात सायकॅट्रीचं काम सुद्धा आत्मीयतेनं करत होते या क्षेत्रातील उच्च शिक्षण पूर्ण केल्यानंतर ते ससूनमध्ये अध्यापन करू लागले आणि पुढे विद्यार्थीप्रिय प्राध्यापकही झाले मनोविकृतींवर इलाज करण्यासाठी पायाभूत सुविधांची आणि मुख्यत मनुष्यबळाची कमतरता त्यांना जाणवत होती ह्या परिस्थितीवर शाश्वत तोडगा काढण्याच्या दृष्टीनं सरकारी लाल फितीतून मार्ग काढत त्यांनी महाराष्ट्र इन्स्टिट्यूट ऑफ मेंटल हेल्थ ह्या संस्थेची स्थापना केली तिचे पहिले डायरेक्टर म्हणून काम पाहताना त्यांनी कल्पनेतल्या योजना झपाट्याने प्रत्यक्षात आणल्या नंतर त्यांनी चित्रपट शिक्षणातील सर्वोत्तम अशा फिल्म अँड टेलिव्हिजन इन्स्टिट्यूट ऑफ इंडियाचं संचालक पदही भूषवलं औपचारिक शिक्षण खुजं आहे ते माणसाला कसं जगावं हे शिकवत नाही असं डॉक्टर आगाशांना तळमळीनं वाटत होतं 
मग हे बदलण्यासाठी त्यांनी कला मानसिक आरोग्य आणि शिक्षण ह्या आपल्या पॅशन्सना एकत्र आणण्याचा प्रयत्न केला ते स्मगलर अशी स्वतःची ओळख सांगू लागले दर्जेदार कलाकृतीमधून शिक्षणाची तस्करी फार चांगल्या पद्धतीने करता येते हे इंगित त्यांना जाणवलं जर्मनीतली ग्रीप्स ही नाट्य चळवळ भारतात रुजवून त्यांनी स्मगलिंगची सुरुवात केली पुढच्या काळात सुमित्रा भावे यांच्या दृष्टिकोनाचा त्यांच्यावर प्रभाव पडला आपल्या आयुष्यभराची पुंजी गुंतवून त्यांनी सुमित्रा ताई आणि सुनील सुप्तनकरांसवे अस्तू कासव दिठी आणि आउट हाऊस या दर्जेदार आणि आशय घन चित्रपटांची निर्मितीही केली छोट्या समूहात सिनेमा दाखवून चर्चा घडवून त्यातून नकळतपणे जीवन शिक्षण घडवायचं हा कार्यक्रम ते गेली दहा वर्षे राबवत आहेत भारत सरकारने त्यांना पद्मश्री व संगीत नाटक अकादमी पुरस्कार देऊन गौरवलंय जर्मन सरकारने देखील त्यांना ऑर्डर ऑफ मेरिट आणि गोयथे मेडल देऊन सन्मानित केलंय त्यांची निर्मिती असलेल्या कासव चित्रपटाला मानाचा राष्ट्रपती सुवर्ण कमळ पुरस्कार देखील मिळाला आहे आगाशे कधीच फार महत्वाकांक्षी नव्हते त्या त्यावेळी उद्भवणाऱ्या परिस्थितीला सन्मुख होत ते प्रवाहीपणे जगले सरधोपट जगण्याचे मार्ग त्यांनी नाकारले लग्न न करून एकटं राहण्याची जोखीम त्यांनी पत्करली देशी परदेशी असंख्य मित्रमंडळींचा गोतावळा जमवला आगाशे जगन मित्रच जे पटेल तेच करणे आणि माणसांविषयी अपार कुतूहल असणे हा त्यांच्या आयुष्याचा गाभा इतरांना टोप्या घालण्यापेक्षा त्यांनी स्वतःच अनेक प्रकारच्या टोप्या आणि शिरपेच दिमाखाने मिरवले टोपी ही त्यांची विशेष ओळख या टोपीमध्ये त्यांनी निरागस संवेदनशील रड्या आगाशे जतन केला अशा ह्या विनम्र मिश्किल आणि चतुरस्र स्मगलरला आज पुण्यभूषण पुरस्कार मिळतो आहे आगाशे सर ह्या निमित्तानं आमच्या गावाचाच गौरव होतोय तुम्हाला तुमच्या पुढील कार्यासाठी अनेक अनेक शुभेच्छा Thank you, Mohan, for sharing with us Thank that moving presentation. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your next projects in your life, Mohan? <laughs> what you well, missed? All said and done. Thank you for this virtual. But again, as I say, our virtual world has grown with such multiplicity. but it cannot replace the fun of the physical and virtual together than only either physical or only virtual so i hope at some point we will combine both and meet again at some point of time somewhere thank you well yeah uh, thank you so much and bohan you know maybe we will have a day when you will physically come here to boston and do this virtual and in person live together we'll work towards that and um unless there are any other questions um we could end the presentation today because it's kind of late in the night for dr agasha as well and we appreciate all your attention for uh, uh, participating and staying Uh, through this wonderful series the uh, presentation will be available it will be it is recorded and will be available for those of you who might have missed it or parts of it and thank you all very much and see you all in the next uh, webinar bye 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 thank everyone you. thank you mohan thank you